Father, we are in your presence, Lord. Thank you so very much for giving us another opportunity that we could come together to study your word, to encourage each other, and to edify and equip each other, Lord. Thank you so much for giving us this uh, platform where we could meet our members from all over this country. As we are going to spend some time in the meditation of your word, I ask for your leading and guidance, especially for your spirits, revelation and illumination so that we may be able to perceive and receive what you want to communicate to us, Lord. Especially I ask for your grace upon uh, Pastor Dan as he's going to teach. I pray that uh, through him, Lord, we may be able to hear your voice and uh, this hour, one hour time that we spend in your, uh, in discussion of your word, Lord, may be beneficial to us. And we may bring glory to your name, change lives. Thank you so very much for listening to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, the title, as I had posted on the group, uh, is uh, What is the Revelation of Jesus Christ to the Church? And with specific reference to uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Uh, I uh, just wanted to mention that this will be a one-off, uh, you know, uh, study. Uh, it is not a study of uh, the book of Revelation because uh, that's going to take some time. But I felt that maybe it will be uh, good after we had done two sessions in the history of the church. Maybe we take a break and do uh, something uh, slightly different. Uh, uh, I just also wanted to mention before I get into the study that uh, uh, our resident theologian, Dr. Gary Dedo, has started a lecture series on the book of Revelation. And uh, he is hoping that he will do initially six lectures and then after that maybe uh, take a break and then come back for maybe six more. Uh, already two are, are finished. Just wanted to mention that in case anyone, if you should be interested uh, and you want the link, let me know. Uh, it is uh, every Saturday morning at 6.30 a.m. Uh, the time is obviously going to be a little bit of a challenge for some of you who are not early risers. Uh, but every Saturday, 6.30 a.m., if you would like to tune in live to uh, Dr. Gary's um, lectures, you are welcome to do so. So I thought I'll just uh, leave you with that information. And so the uh, information, I mean to say the uh, study today, obviously I have reference to Gary Dedo's lectures. Uh, and also I've been uh, referring a, uh, or rather reading a book by a theologian called Brett Davies. Uh, he has written a book uh, which is titled, See the Strange, Gospel according to Revelation. So um, this, uh, these are some of my references and of course my own uh, personal study in this book. Now getting into the book of Revelation is always uh, challenging. <laughs> some of you know that, uh, you know, uh, we, have, we have delved into the book of Revelation a fair bit in our past. And we made several predictions, which possibly was not uh, according to uh, what it should actually have been. And if you notice today, the book of Revelation is a favorite book amongst many uh, who would like to get into these predictions. You know, they, in fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, just recently I saw somewhere, somebody giving a lecture and talking about July 24. July 24 is D-Day for the earth. <laughs> I'm presuming he has referred to the book of Revelation. So watch out you guys, July 24th. <laughs> so anyway, predictions uh, uh, are done, but predictions are many times false. Uh, and unfortunately, the book of Revelation gets a bad name because of that. Uh, uh, you know, what we need to recognize is the book, uh, the book of Revelation does not predict dates. Uh, but it, the predictions are something else. And so 
But like I said, I'm not getting into a big study of the book. Maybe we'll do that sometime. Um, but I just want to focus on uh, chapter two and three, if you remember reading uh, those chapters, uh, it is letters to various churches in Asia Minor at that time, 2000 years back when John wrote, uh, uh, Jesus Christ wanted John to record these messages and they were to be letters you know, to these churches. And so do they have relevance for us? And I believe it, it, it does have, and that is what I want to focus on today. What is the message of, or rather I should say, what is the revelation of Jesus Christ to the church? And my subtitle is Macro Picture of Revelation 2 and 3. So let me just do a brief introduction Obviously, no details whatsoever that I have luxury of time to go into. Uh, very brief introduction in, uh, you know, uh, uh, as far as what is this book all about? Uh, it, it probably is necessary for me to say that the book of the entire book, we call it the book, but it's actually a letter, you know, uh, written to these churches. And the, they are written in in a particular style of literature. Uh, so uh, we, we call them apocalyptic, you know, style or genre, you know, for those of you who are English majors, uh, that is the literary style of a book, right? Uh, once again, I will read from the book and make some comments. Now I'm going to Revelation chapter one uh, and right away at the very beginning, uh, Revelation chapter one. Uh, it begins by saying the revelation from Jesus Christ. Some translations have it as of Jesus Christ. So the revelation of or from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So uh, right there, you begin to see from whom the revelation is. It is actually from God the Father to Jesus Christ and to the church, right? To the churches. Uh, so it is both, uh, I would say uh, it's inclusive. It could be a revelation. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ that is Jesus Christ is being revealed. And also it is a revelation from Jesus Christ because it is what God wants Jesus or the God the Father wants Jesus to convey to the churches. Um, also, I would like you to note that it's the revealing of Jesus and from Jesus, right? Now, I want you to no notice the word reveal. It's a revelation from Jesus or the word reveal. It is not a hiding. It is not uh, camouflaging. It is not codifying. You see, it is not uh, make, making the message. It is not making the message obscure. It is revealing. It is showing and helping us to see something very important that the book wants us to see. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ himself. And that is one big mistake lots of people make, thinking that Revelation is a coded book. It has a secret code, and you need a key to open it. And we used to talk about that sometime in the past, that what is the key to the book of Revelation? All right. Uh, I, I, I beg to differ on that because the very word Revelation is from the Greek apocalypse. The, uh, the word apocalypse means revealing. It is not hiding or codifying or camouflaging, right? And in case you think that you need a key to understand, <laughs> the key is Jesus Christ himself, right? I'm reading from verse 18, chapter one, Revelation. 
chapter 1 verse 18 it says i am the living one this is jesus christ obviously a reference to jesus christ i am the living one i was dead and now look i am alive forevermore ever and ever rather and i hold the keys of death and hades so jesus christ holds the keys he is the key and so um, uh, if ever you hear people talk about that you need a key to open the book of revelation well you know you have it right there in the book christ himself is the key okay let me refer to uh, one more verse in the book of uh, in the cha in chapter 1 and i'm going to read from verse 4 it says john to the seven churches in the province of asia grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from jesus christ who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth right so in verse 4 the first part says this is a communication to seven churches in the province of asia all right and from whom is it well uh, it is from the one who is who was and is to come obviously a reference to the eternal the eternal nature of jesus christ himself right right there now notice it says seven churches why uh, this word this rather this number seven is something that occurs very uh, uh, time and time again and very often in this book you know for example uh, you have seven churches here you, it also speaks of the seven spirits it speaks of what the seven seals the seven angels, the seven trumpets. So the number seven is significant in the book of Revelation. And uh, what is this number, what or what reference this number could have that it is being used so often? And scholars have agreed on the fact that the, word, the number seven is a number for fullness. Uh, it is a number of wholeness or a whole, you know, uh, you could say it's a it's a symbolic number of completeness. For example, even at the very beginning of the Bible, you have the seven day account of creation. Right? So the number seven is very significant in the book and of course in the scriptures itself. So it is being written to the seven churches in Asia. So the message is specific to the seven churches, but we can safely assume that it is a message to the church as a whole down through the ages, right? Uh, Brett Davies in his book, uh, See the Strange, Gospel According to Revelation, he says, uh, even though this message is to the seven churches in particular, it intentionally, intentionally includes us, even us after 2000 years. In other words, it is a reference to the entire church, the whole church, right? He says, the letter reveals a large pattern or a constellation of lessons. So there are several lessons we need to learn from this book. Uh, we can say while there is a uh, a micro level message right that is to the seven local churches the structure of the book also shows that there is a macro level message and that is to the whole church in all ages if i can refer to one more scripture here before we get into uh, the two chapters mentioned revelation 2 and verse 17 this is something that uh, occurs uh, repeatedly it says whoever has ears let them hear what the spirit, singular, says to the churches, plural, right? In other words, this seemed to indicate that, of course, we must take heed to what the spirit is saying, but the spirit is having a special message to the churches. So all the seven churches were to hear the message, the message to, you know, all the churches. So... Um, uh, having said that, this is 
just a very very brief sort of uh, introduction to uh, you know to the book. There is so much more we need to talk about. Once again, we probably we will get into it sometime later. But I want to now specifically go and ask the question: What is the message to the churches, right? The seven churches in particular, but. I hope I could establish the fact that it is also a message for the church, uh, you know, capital church, the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the universal church down through the ages. All right. Now, what we'll do is I thought we should read, chap uh, you know, chapters two and three, but I want to deliberately read it at the end, uh, even though we must allow scripture to lead us. But... I have read it and I feel it, it could have an effect once you have heard what I have to say, it could have an effect when we read it actually towards the end. So allow me or indulge me as I, uh, you know, uh, begin the study first and then we will do the actual reading of the scriptures. Okay. Uh, there are some, you know, uh, some vital lessons or vital messages that God wants the churches to hear. And it comes out, you know, as you read through all of those messages, and I have uh, captured them on under broad headings. All right. My first broad heading or the first broad message to the church as a whole is appreciation. Right. God appreciates the work of the church. Let me read to you from Revelation 2, beginning in verse 1. To the church, to, or rather, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now, this is the church in Ephesus, which is a city in Asia. Right. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, he says in verse 2, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. Verse 3, you have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Did you see how... how um, uh, it has a solid message of appreciation, right? In other words, the message to the Ephesus church and to the church, the universal church, is Jesus recognizes our service. Jesus is not blind to the, to the hard work that many of us put down through the ages, even today, how there are so many who work so hard for the church and carry on the work, uh, you know, of uh, what God wants us to. Uh, Jesus Christ is very much aware of our hard work. He does not forget any of the work that we put, however small it might be, right? Uh, and uh, we don't quantify that work in terms of people, but we recognize each one contributes in some way. You know, all the saints of the church contributes in some way to how the church functions and how it carries on the, the wonderful work of Jesus Christ our Lord, right? And let me also say that even though we serve and we work and sometimes we are not recognized for it, we are not, uh, you know, patted on the back for it sometimes, maybe people don't appreciate as much, but God does. Jesus Christ never forgets the work that we do. And why does he do that? Obviously, the message is to encourage the church. And it is particularly necessary for that appreciation to come from Jesus because the church is doing work in very difficult times. All through the ages, the church has faced very difficult times. And God knows that we need the appreciation so that we may not get discouraged that we may continue to be encouraged to carry on, to persevere, not to grow weary in well-doing, like it says uh, in, uh, in uh, the message to Ephesus. So that's one broad heading we can glean from all the messages to the churches. In every 
almost all of the churches are appreciated for the good work they do. Maybe you know, <laughs> the last one, Laodicea, maybe not uh, you know, particularly, but nevertheless, all churches are appreciated, right? Second broad message to the church that the church will face persecution and hardship. Let me read to you from Revelation 2, and now I'll go to the church at Smyrna, right? Revelation 2, verse 9. I know, he says, your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Now I am just speaking one, you know, uh, a message to one church, but this is a recurring theme to all the churches and obviously to the church at large down through the ages. What is the message? We need to understand that the church will suffer persecution. The church will suffer hardship. The church and the members will go through very, very difficult times. And we should not be shocked or we should not be surprised. We should not uh, feel that, oh, why is the church going through so much of suffering? Well, it is prophesied that the church will go through this. All right. Uh, uh, and down through the ages, if you see, and we have, you know, seen some of it in church history, down through the ages, the churches have gone through tremendous amount of persecution, even to the extent of so many being martyred for the name of Jesus Christ. So what is the broad message we take away from this? I, even as we live in the 21st century, we must not be surprised. We must not deny the fact that, that they, could, they could descend upon us suffering, persecution, and hardship. We must not be tempted to go into unbelief when this comes, because Jesus has said the church will suffer just as he suffered. All right. That is my second, uh, I mean, to say, uh, uh, caption that I would use that the church will suffer persecution. Let's go to the third one. The third broad message to the, uh, to specifically the churches in Asia, as well as now down through the ages. That message is the church has enemies. The church will have enemies, right? And right when we read in, in Revelation 2 about Smyrna, he talks about the synagogue of Satan. Right there, we have one identified enemy, Satan and the devil. But there are others. There are false teachers. There are false accusers. These are all enemies to the church. And Jesus Christ wants the church to know that the church has very powerful enemies. And we must not once again be surprised that we are being countered, right? Let me read to you from Revelation 2, verse 12. I will go now to the third church in Asia, Pergam Pergamum. In Revelation 2 verse 12, it says, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. So once again, uh, the broad message to the church as a whole is the church has very powerful enemies, beginning from Satan and the devil, the, uh, the dark unseen forces of darkness that opposes the church, the opposes the brethren, accuses the brethren. And some of them will actively work against us through accusations inspired of Satan, the devil. And unfortunately, sometimes their accusations are also from within the church. 
And that is, of course, so unfortunate, so sad that even that happens. But even that, Jesus has told that it will happen, that there will be enemies, not just from the cosmic energy, enemy of the dark forces, but also from within ourselves. And of course, as you will see around us, where there are powers and principalities, where there are, you know, uh, the various uh, leader leadership of various church i mean to say governments i mean there are some difficulties that we have to face and sometimes they're against the church so the church will have enemies so that is another very broad message we get from reading these messages to these churches i have uh, three more to go to the next broad message that Jesus Christ gives to the church. And I'm going to read from Revelation 2. Uh, this is the church at Thyatira. Let me give you the broad message. The broad message is the, ch the church tends to go wrong from time to time and needs correction. The church tends to go wrong from time to time and needs correction. Revelation 2, uh, the message to Thyatira, verse 20 says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. So very clearly here, and once again to all the churches, we see Jesus Christ is warning the church that yes, we can, tend, we can be wrong sometimes. We are misled sometimes, maybe influenced by false teachers and the whole church can go off in the wrong direction embrace wrong doctrines this is something that christ has warned the churches to be aware of right we must be careful that we don't allow false teaching to influence uh, and he's also saying sometimes the churches have compromised on morality and allowed themselves to become too worldly allowed the world to enter them more than you know the holy spirit uh, maybe the church keeps wrong company with certain uh, very influential, you know, uh, organizations, people, whatever. But here is something that the church needs to keep in mind. How are we correcting ourselves? Because God says that I will cast her on the bed of suffering. God will sometimes chastise the church. God will do it in his love. Obviously, he doesn't do it, you know, with malice. He does it so that he wants us to reform. Uh, the book constantly is helping us to recognize reform, reform. If you can get one major theme of the entire book, it is reformation. It is not a coded message to know what's going to happen in, you know, 2024. <laughs> But it is basically helping us understand that my people, you, the church, needs to constantly be in the, in the attitude of reformation. And I'm proud to say I belong to uh, a, a denomination that has not only believed in reformation, but we have proved it through our, you know, our testimony that when we were found wrong, we decided that we will reform ourselves. So one solid message to the church. Yes, you will tend to go wrong. And we have seen that happen time and time again. And even today, we see many, many denominations with all kinds of weird doctrines, doctrines that are not supported by the scriptures going off in the wrong direction. All right, that's another major message that, the, that Jesus wants us, the church, to know. Uh, two more solid or broad messages. The next one is repentance, to hold fast 
do not fear and endure. This is a recurring theme, not only to the churches in the book of Revelation 2 and 3, but it is something that is recurring through the entire book, that there is a need for repentance, to have an attitude of repentance, to continue to hold fast, and not to allow fear to influence us, but to remain endure, you know, to endure until the very end. Let me read to you the message to the church at Sardis, Revelation 3, now the next uh, chapter. I presume, yes, this is verse 1, Revelation 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your de deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember verse three, therefore, what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. So notice those words. I mean, uh, wake up, repent, right? You've gone, you've gone wrong or you've gone to sleep. You've become spiritually uh, cold. You have spiritually drifted away. You need to wake up and get back to the work, get back on the job, right? So, uh, and so what Christ is doing here is encouraging us to hold fast through an attitude of repentance where we recognize what the error is and we can move in the correct direction. So the church is constantly being encouraged to reform, to remain obviously vigilant of backsliding because that happens many a times. Many churches go into total backsliding. And unfortunately, there are some whole denominations that is more interested in politics and money and church buildings rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was uh, talking to the late Mr. Jones, who was the father of Mr. Prithvi Ranjan. Uh, and, uh, you know, many, on many occasions, I used to visit him in his home. And he was a secretary. He was uh, appointed a secretary of the Church of South India of the, uh, uh, of the diocese here in Hyderabad. I think it's called the Medak Diocese. And he was, had a fancy title. He was called the property secretary. <laughs> in other words, and I said, uh, Mr. Jones, what do you spend most of your time doing? And he had these huge files. He said, every single day I am either dealing with, either going to the court or dealing with one church property problem or the other. <laughs> uh, it's unfortunate, but a huge denomination like that has, you know, that has so much of property and yet they are so distracted by all of these problems that I don't think they really have time to focus on the message of Jesus Christ. So we are encouraged to reform, uh, to remain vigilant, like I said. Uh, and to remain open to correction. The churches, as a church as a whole, must remain open to correction. In other words, let us not fear such correction, or let us not fear the circumstance, right? God tells us not to live in fear, but uh, to remain confident in Jesus Christ, who is the conqueror. We can't conquer, but Christ has already conquered as the Lamb of God. Through his blood, he has conquered. And all we have to do is participate in that great victory of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, one more broad message, and then I'll leave you with one more thought as we uh, complete. The last broad message I'd like to give uh, to you as we read in the scriptures is the reward is great, right? Jesus Christ reminds, reminds the churches that there is a great reward for all of us as his saints, as, as his people. Reading in Revelation 3, again to the church at Sardis, verse 4, it says, Yet you have a few people in 
sardas who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me. Now notice the reward. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. The one, verse 5, the one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angel and his angels. Here is the promise to the churches. You know, you have so many warnings, but now comes as, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, we close out these particular specific messages to the churches that God says there is a reward for the endurance that we will remain in. Uh, it's a promise of the Father, Son, and Spirit that God will work, always work for our best interest and in our best interest. And so because of that, we continue to participate in Christ who has conquered, right? So even though we are told to repent, wake up, but he also encourages us by a reward. Notice it starts off by appreciation and then he, he solidly you know, backs it up by telling us that there is a great reward. Okay, so that is what I have understood from the Revelation 2 and 3. Like I said, these broad messages are to all the churches and even to us in the, you know, hopefully in the end times, end of the end times. Right now, let me leave you with one more thought. Uh, this I feel is necessary to make because sometimes we can uh, we can have the wrong uh, you know uh, impression with regards to where is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit as far as the churches are concerned. Where is Christ in as far as the church is concerned? You know, sometime back I was uh, criticized by a comment in the YouTube <laughs> saying that when I said that the Holy Spirit continues to lead the church and somebody wrote and said, oh, how can the Holy Spirit be involved with such corrupt churches? In other words, the Holy Spirit has left those churches, right? Uh, I beg to differ, right? And I will prove it here in the book of Revelation, right? Where is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit? Let me just read to you uh, some references. I'll go to Revelation 1 now and verse 12. It says, Revelation 1 verse 12, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Verse 13 says, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. Okay, what are these golden lampstands? Now, I'm, I'm sure you all understand and know who this person is, right? Someone like the Son of Man, dressed in robe, reaching down to his, obviously referring to Jesus Christ, okay, the Son of, the Son of God. What are these golden lampstands? The answer is given in verse 20, Revelation 1 verse 20, it says, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So where is Jesus Christ? Among the lampstands, right? Uh, in verse 12, it says, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands, someone like the son of man. Where is Jesus Christ? Among the lampstands, what are the lampstands? The churches, the church, all through the ages, Jesus Christ is still with the church in spite of the fact that the church can go wrong, in spite of the fact that the church can be polluted sometimes. Jesus Christ never leaves nor forsakes. He is constantly working to reform the churches. And where is the Holy Spirit? Verse 22, Revelation 1. Uh, it says, or rather, I think, uh, Revelation. Uh, Revelation 2 verse 22. It says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Where is the Spirit? He is constantly leading the churches, right? He is, the Spirit is constantly speaking to the churches. 
guiding the church, <laughs> helping the churches. The church, the spirit is with the church, in the church, right, along with Jesus Christ. And the reason I want to say that and emphasize it is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is not absent, even in spite of the wickedness that is found in the churches or the failures that we might uh, we might uh, you know come across as far as churches are concerned. But there are some who deny and say, "Oh, you know, Christ is you know forsaken the church." Now it is possible that some people don't want Christ, but Christ goes nowhere, and He is constantly hoping that there will be reformation in however corrupt the church may have become. And I say that particularly because um, there are some, and unfortunately sometimes in our own fellowship, that tend to think that all the churches are pagan, all the churches are, you know, are Satan's synagogues. You know, Jesus Christ is not, we don't worship the true Jesus. That we don't worship the, you know, and, and as though Jesus Christ has left us. And that is not, I mean to say, the fact that Jesus is still with the church and the Holy Spirit is with the church is very clear here, down through the ages. All right, so what is the message to the church? Right, uh, uh, which is the title of my uh, uh, Bible study. Here. The message to the church is that while God appreciates the church is for the hard work and the dedication to service. The church must not forget that there will be persecution and hardships will come, right? And many times we contend with enemies without the church and within the church. We contend with you know, dark forces in the spiritual realms. And many a times we will go wrong. And all the churches have gone wrong in some way or the other. But when we go wrong, we must be vigilant to repent and accept correction. And to then hold fast to the faith that God has given to us. Not to go into fear, not to live with a sense of fear, but to remain enduring at all times. Why? Because the reward is great. That is the message that we glean from Revelation 2 and 3 to particularly the seven churches in Asia Minor and to the church at large down through the ages. Just give me, uh, you know, just a few more minutes as I read Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, you may follow along in the script in the Bible if you have one. I'm reading from a, a particular version of NIV. Uh, and uh, I hope that as I read through, you will begin to see how those messages have fit in so well and something that we need to be mindful of. Beginning in uh, Revelation 2 verse 1, right? To the angel of the church in Ephesus. Thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You, uh, you have test, uh, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. Yes, you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And yet, you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who hears, who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Verse 8, write to the church of the angel of the church in Smyrna. Thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and poverty, but you are rich. 
I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you. And, uh, um, and you will experience affliction for 10 days. Be faithful to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. Write to the church, the angel of the church in Pergamum. Thus says the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in, in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death among you where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have seen, you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam and who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites to eat meat sacrifice to idols and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So repent, otherwise I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone and a stone and uh, on the stone, a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. Write to the church, uh, to the angel of the church in Thyatira. Thus says the son of God, the one whose eyes are like fury flame and whose feet are like fine bronze. I know your works, your love, faithfulness, service, and endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first, but I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat meat sacrifice to idols. I give her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. Look, I will throw her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction, unless they repent of her works. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your works. I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who haven't known the so-called secrets of Satan, as they say, I am not putting any other burden on you. Only hold to what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. He will rule with, a, with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery, just as I have received this from my father. I will also give him the morning star. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the spirit says to the churches. All right, that's Revelation 2. I'll read, I'll leave Revelation 3 for you to read, okay? But I, I just wanted to read so that you will see that flow and those broad messages to all the churches, even to us today. Well, let me stop there and uh, look for some comments or, uh, or any questions that you might have. Go ahead. Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, with due permission of uh, Mr. Surya Murthy, today I want to be the icebreaker <laughs> and uh, I want to be the opening batsman. I want to have that privilege. Sir, uh, would you please repeat, sir, the significance of the number seven? And is it the, you, is it the same from Genesis to Revelation? Uh, okay. The number seven is used quite often in the book of Revelation and also in you know, some parts of the Bible. And I used uh, the seven days of, cre you know, the, the creation account, which is in seven days. Uh, so the number seven seemed to be significant, especially in the book of Revelation. And once again, I would, you know, I, I, I defer to some of the scholars who have studied this. I have not done a number study as such, but I would like to just say that uh, uh, the number seven is seem to indicate a number for fullness or wholeness, right? Uh, it seems to have a symbolic significance for completeness, 
right? That is how some of the scholars put it, right? Uh, and so the word that the number seven to the seven churches is probably an indication that it is actually to the whole church because seven represents wholeness, fullness. And hence the message is not just for the seven local churches, but also to the church at large down through the ages. Does that help, Franklin? Uh, Franklin is not responding. I don't know what happened. Uh, okay, uh, we'll wait for him. I think he's probably got an internet problem. Any other thoughts or questions? Please feel free to comment if you have some thoughts that you'd like to share in addition. Yes, Bertram, go ahead. Um, Zachariah, you mentioned that in the, the, in the message to the angel of the church in Laodicea, uh, uh, there, is a, uh, there is that uh, uh, appreciation which is missing, <laughs> um, so to speak. Um, okay. Is, uh, is, does it have any, uh, could you just touch upon that? Uh, I, well, let me just uh, go back. Uh, you're talking about uh, Laodicea, right? I mean, uh, the, the reason I made that comment is many times, you know, if you remember our past teachings, we used to pride ourselves that we are we are in the era of Philadelphia and the Laodicean church is a lukewarm church and they will go into persecution, right? While we in the Philadelphian era will be spared. And I was just remembering that when I said that, but um, uh, let me just see uh, it. Um, uh, right to the angel of the church in Laodicea, thus says the amen, the the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, he says, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say I'm rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed. And then he goes on to say in verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Uh, so there was no specific words of appreciation, but that doesn't mean to say that God doesn't appreciate the hard work of the Laodicean church, because many of them, I'm sure, came out of lukewarmness. And perhaps if they were persecuted, I'm sure they have learned their lessons. So um, I am not seeing specific words of appreciation, but the fact that God addresses the church at Le Laodicea is clear indication. He loves them. He wants to rebuke them so that he, they can reform. And in that respect, he, uh, you know, appreciate, I mean to say, uh, uh, certainly, you know, stamps an approval of, of appreciation on them. I don't know if that helps, Bertie, but I, I'm just... Uh... Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Suri Murthy, go ahead. There is a mention of second death. When you are reading the verses. So that makes me thinking about the concept of the first resurrection, second resurrection. Okay, <laughs> all right. That is what we used to teach, right? Three resurrections and then uh, first death, second death. Um, if you notice that while I was, uh, you know, bringing you uh, some thoughts from the two uh, chapters, I did not specifically take out uh, some of the language used there and try to try to decipher it. Uh, and the reason I 
deliberately have not done that is because I don't think that uh, is the main point. There is a major theme running through each of those messages, right? And that is what I wanted to pick up. When you start going into the micro-ness, my, I'm looking at the macro picture, but when you look at the micro details, uh, we may or may not understand what it means. For example, uh, you, uh, I mean, you, uh, the, 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 one of the churches, uh, God mentions Nicol Nicolaitans. Now, scholars seem to vary in their interpretation of what that means. What is the work of the Nicolaitans? Uh, we don't know for sure. And so we should not get stuck in those details because you miss then the, the woods from the trees, like they say, right? Is that right? Is that the right expression? I'm not sure. But you miss the major picture. So when it mentions the second death, perhaps, now once again, I'm speculating, uh, perhaps Jesus, uh, God is trying to help us understand that, that we are secure, we are safe. We don't have to worry eternal damnation or eternal separation. Uh, we don't have to fear and we don't have to live in that sense of fear. And maybe that is the broader picture I would like to paint. But if I, if you start knit, you know, going into too much detail and saying there is a first death and it's going to happen 1000 years later, there is a second death and then there should be a three resurrection. I'm sorry, I, 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 I <laughs> put my hands up and say, I don't want to get into those details because I don't think I can 100% uh, be able to decipher exactly what is meant there. Am I making sense, Suri <laughs> Yes, 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 very much. Okay. Uh, another question. Yeah. Uh, there in, in 228, chapter 2, verse 28, I will give yeah. him the morning star. I is Jesus Christ. Am I right? I will okay. give him the one. Yes. So, what's your question? <laughs> Who is the monster? <laughs> yeah. Once again, you're getting into those details, which is... <laughs> uh, 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 no, once again, I've not, I have not looked at the entire context there. Uh, I don't know, some of you might have read. Uh, Bertie, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, go ahead. Uh, no, I just thought of uh, uh, requesting uh, Praveen uh, to, uh, to give his comments, if he has any. <laughs> well, I'm sure he has a few. <laughs> but, uh, but if I can just say, you know, in one sense, the morning star, uh, you know, could be Christ himself. Uh, you know, even though it says, I, I will also give him the morning star, it, it, it is basically probably meaning he'll give himself to us. In other words, he is with us and we will be with him. He'll be in us and we'll be in him. And I'm presuming, once again, I am not, uh, I, I, I can't point to a particular verse in that respect. Right. Okay. Uh, Bertie, did you have any thought? I am not sure. Uh, or, or, uh... I just, uh, just uh, thought I'll draw your attention yeah. to asking Praveen if he oh, has okay. any. <laughs> well, let's, let's give the last word to Praveen then. By the way, I just, I just got a message from Franklin saying that uh, power is gone and so he's unable to join. So. Okay. Pastor Praveen, Pastor Sachin. <laughs> yeah, please come in. I truly appreciate uh, what Pastor Dan has presented. I guess uh, this is um, a very right and uh, perspective to look at Book of uh, Revelation, especially with the title starting from the title itself. Uh, Revelation, it is unveiling. It is not about finding some mysteries, and uh, the greatest mystery has already already revealed that is Christ in us, the hope of glory. So God is not calling us to, uh, to oh, you know, discover something from the mysteries and all. And ultimately, uh, He revealed Himself. Uh, he revealed everything that has to be revealed and uh, and that has to be known for us as we are living in this flesh. 
uh, flesh and blood and definitely i also would like to make a comment on the same thing i was about to say uh, the what is the morning star you talk about crown of righteousness crown of life uh, all these words they are very well suits with the nature of christ these are like uh, a particular church is there and they must be lacking in a particular thing and god is saying i'm going to revive you and give you so on so thing for somebody he said i will give you a crown of righteousness there he is going to lead the church into a revolutionary movement towards uh, 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 exploring the righteousness in christ jesus probably so uh, one thing we need to understand as we are reading book of revelation completely that is when we read book of revelation what we need to know what we need to learn is who christ is again our purpose is not to find when the world is going to come to an end what are the uh, minute details or what are the seven uh, cro- th- seven horns on this animal and so those kind of things but ultimately when it is said it is the revelation of jesus christ we should be able to find jesus christ from revelation 1 to 22 I saw twenty one. I guess I just got confused. Till the end, if we are not able to find Christ in these in throughout the book, then we need to understand that we are not reading the scripture properly. We are not reading this book very much. We are really in its perspective. So, as Christians, our purpose when we read Book of Revelation is it's to be it has to be finding Jesus, knowing Jesus more and more, and which is going to help us. and author also he encourages us to read more and to he says uh, people who hear it they are also blessed who read it are blessed and there are no other books which has such a great uh, blessings uh, you know uh, attached with the reading and all as this book of revelation so we should never be deviated by so on so whatever the things we bring there are some kind of perspective some theology some uh, ideologies that were already said so they try to fix the the fit this book into their ideology so what happens is we will be misled into uh, all sorts of things and we where we what we need to focus is as hebrew author of hebrew says look unto jesus who is author and perfecter of our faith so as we read book of revelation also we should be focused on jesus and these seven churches what we are reading they can be seven stages of personal spiritual experience also we personally can take in those uh, sense and it can be a journey of a particular church one church we can take even our church we can take we have various phases uh, in our own journey and we will be identifying with one or other of these seven churches at a particular period of time so this is this is about churches of all times all churches all everywhere so in all spiritual journey so we need to be focused more on that and look unto jesus that's my comment and i appreciate the perspective pastor led us uh, through through this teaching thank you praveen uh, i'm i apologize that we've gone a little over time but since this is a one off uh, i hope you don't mind taking a little extra time let's see if uh, pastor sachin has any thoughts to share with us uh i think sachin is also frozen uh, sachin can you hear us uh, you seemed a little <laughs> uh before we come to you surimurthy did you have a question and maybe sachin can answer that uh mr praveen is talking about finding jesus in the, in the book of revelation throughout uh, i don't disagree but why we are not uh, trying to find the father in that why we are always concentrating on jesus the primary it is when we said uh, father uh, the author of same author of book of revelation john said if you have he he said uh, his experience with jesus where jesus said if you have seen me you have seen the father if you found jesus we have found the father uh, of course it is there and uh, having said that uh one thing i would like to tell like uh, entire christianity is uh, all christian belief and faith is based on one single line that we can say that is knowing god in the face of jesus christ that is christianity it is not finding some hidden first a hidden god somewhere but the god who revealed in jesus christ that is what we are coming to know 
we are called christians because we came to realize we found the face of god in jesus that is the reason we are calling ourselves christians so uh, you know uh, our purpose is not in fact in, in in timothy apostle paul says father lives uh, in an approachable light not even approachable so reveal uh, finding out and all are secondary okay so as christians our focus our life our faith is completely based on knowing the father who is revealed in jesus christ that's why we talk about christ sachin any thoughts you like to share i was i was drawn into morning star <laughs> no uh, so i i think uh, uh, mr suryamurthy every time what we read what is revealed to us about christ through the holy spirit is about god and and and, and it just continues it it our our heart keep expanding as the holy spirit keep con- convicting us and everything that we are reading about the son is about the father and what the son is revealing us his heart so i i don't see differentiation there and on the morning star i believe it is the fullness of christ it it is as, as pravin has shared two three words right it's also morning star we'll have him we'll give we'll receive a morning star it is having the fullness of him even even when in second peter 1:19 uh, we read that in our heart it, it, the the verse ends with the christ the morning star shines in our heart so it it's again the revelation we continue to have the fullness of christ in us we know him absolutely but it the, the fullness of it keeps growing as the holy spirit reveals us so that's how i was drawn into that i was <laughs> see right. so that's it okay yeah that's very helpful thank you for both of you and uh, uh if if i can also just mention that uh, you know all three father son and holy spirit are mentioned jesus refers to the father the holy spirit speaks to the churches and jesus christ is being revealed so all three of them there then as you had a thought go ahead uh, are there two books of revelation or only one book of revelation means uh, there, there is an old testament and a new testament so Okay. And the Old Testament was there. Where were, were there? There were revolu- uh, revelations over there, and now there is a New Testament, and there are revelations there. So now Jesus has come. So, so what does it reveal to us? Like, uh, for example, for example, I am telling you, you say that uh, we we need to know the Father through Jesus. Okay, in our family, in our family, there is the grandfather. the father and the child now if the child goes directly or loves the fa- grandparent father more than the father so is there any jealousy or is there any any such uh, feelings that that the child is going straight to the grandfather instead of the father or does the child have to first go to the father only to go to the grandfather so it's same it's same with with god the father the son and and of course us I don't know. Okay. It's too Look, mixed up. I think I'm telling. <laughs> no, I I see there are two questions there actually. You first hmm. asked about are there two books of Revelation? Hmm. Uh, I think uh, if I fact just to, to give you a simple answer, there is only one book of Revelation in the Bible, and it is in the New Testament. But there are revelations in the Old Testament in the sense that God, you know, gives us some revelations, you know, through the prophets, through uh, you know, down through the ages. so don't mix up revelations from the book of revelation the book of revelation is a specific uh, book which is in the new testament i hope that uh, helps and then you mentioned about um, uh the child going directly to the grandfather and then the father is going to be upset uh if <laughs> if that happened in the in the tri- in the triune god then we have uh, we have no hope <laughs> uh because there is absolutely no aberration in terms of the love that the father son holy spirit 
uh, resides in amongst themselves. And there is absolutely no jealousy or envy, you know, that exists within the, tri the, the, the triune reality. So uh, uh, I don't know how else to answer your question. I don't know if anybody else have any thoughts on that. Please feel free. Bertie, go ahead. Uh, we must always uh, remember, as we know, the triune God that uh, that the triune God is the Godhead, and when we say Father, to me, I understand that uh, God, Word, and Spirit, or Father, Son, and Spirit are dwelling. When we say Holy Spirit, it means uh, the Son, Father, and the Holy Spirit are dwelling, as also with the Son. It is the Godhead was in the Son. And the Godhead will also be with us because we are in the we are in Christ. It's only through Christ we have access to the Father, uh, uh, through the Son, with the Father by the Holy Spirit. So even we will have the Godhead dwelling in us. So uh, 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 the Bible is perfectly right, you know, in this uh, relationship. And the Godhead is at work. Okay. Uh, whether we say the Father, whether we say the Spirit, whether we say the Son. Thank you, Bertie. If I can just say that what you said, Vanessa, might happen in a human family, but it never happens in the triune God. <laughs> yeah. Coming to what Vanessa said, a simple example I would like to bring from the Bible, uh, which directly, uh, I guess, relates to your question. You said if uh, somebody comes to the grandfather directly, father may feel jealous. So if you're coming to the father directly, Jesus does Jesus feel jealous, or does if you're coming to the son only, father feels jealous? Is it the is it the state is it the way you are you ask the question right? Yeah, I asked that, and I just wanted to make sure, and not make sure, just that. Uh, there are so many people in the world who pray directly to God. Like I, I also told you all my first experience, I never used to pray to Jesus. I never mentioned his word for so many years in my life, not mentioned Jesus. I used to pray to just God the Father. So for the past two years, as I told you, and after I joined Grace Church, now I start saying Jesus. But when I, I, when I say Jesus, still in my heart of hearts, like my faith, oh my, I don't know. I feel like it's a sham for me. Like in my mind, in my heart, it is still only God the Father. So I feel more comfortable. Like when in my prayers, I say Father or oh God. So like I find it is, it is just not happening with me. Just mentioning or thinking that, okay, I have to go to the Father to Jesus. But then Jesus is not coming in that sense to me. It is coming only God. So that is what I'm saying. Like it's the grandfather. Suppose I am going straight to the grandfather instead of going through the father. So I, I don't think so. It should matter much in my life that this, uh, like God says, you have to come through me, through my son. Or, or Jesus will say, you have to go to the father through me. So I am. Um... Coming to that, only a couple of just uh, verses I would like to share with you. Number one, if you read, I would like to encourage you to read book of John. Uh, you will come across these words. Number one, uh, Jesus says, no one can come to me until the father draws. So if somebody is coming to Jesus, that means it is father who drew people to Jesus. Number one. So father, he won't be jealous to bring people to Jesus. So if you went to Jesus, he won't be offended. Because he himself brings people. Unless he brings, nobody can come to Jesus. Number two thing. Jesus, he is bringing people to God. That's why we all are, we are kind of, come, come to me all who labor and have heavy laden, I will give you rest. That's what Jesus said. The author of Hebrews says, we have a high priest. With confidence, we can go to him. Okay. God, Jesus, he is drawing all of us to the Father. Okay, that is that is the next thing. And third thing is Holy Spirit is bringing people to Jesus. So these three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are drawing people. Father is drawing people to the Son. Son is drawing people to the Father. Holy Spirit is drawing to them. It is not like there are three different people where three persons where sorry, different people where they feel jealous kind of thing. It is more like, you know, uh, one great thing I would like to bring. See, regarding the glory. What, the Holy Spirit never seeks glory for himself. He, he, he loves to glorify the Son. What does Son do? Son, he doesn't seek glory for himself. He seeks Father should be glorified. 
and father doesn't seek glory for himself he seek the uh, glory for the son so they are seeking glory of each other where they are completely in other, uh, completely other centered that is the very reason they don't feel jealous amongst themselves they in fact they they are they want to bring more people to others like so if you go if you directly address god as father and prayed no problem nobody is going to feel jealous if you directly address son nobody is going to feel jealous if you address the holy spirit nobody is going to jealous because all these three work together they are together and they are one so don't be worried about this freely happily comfortably whatever you have prayers you offer to god we pray in jesus name that is not as okay this is the license the name of jesus is the license for us to go to the father it is not like that it is like we are recognizing the father through jesus that's all nothing else okay i hope uh, those were helpful and clarifying and once again apologies that we have gone over time today uh, but uh, once again thank you so much for joining us let's end now uh, don't want to keep you uh, you know further can i request uh, pastor sachin to lead us in a closing prayer today thank you sure please join with me as we pray heavenly father gracious lord we come before your throne of grace and mercy with bold confidence through the work of Christ the Lord and with the power of the Holy Spirit thank you for this time o oh lord for uh studying your word understanding o oh lord god and for your holy spirit that is revealing your nature your word uh, more and more unto us o oh lord god and it is our prayer o oh lord that let the holy spirit convict us uh to know more of you o oh lord and to have uh a, a, a relationship with you, Lord, and to enable us to be in communion with you all the time, O Lord. Uh, at times, uh, our humanly imagination, understanding can be limited, O Lord, but you are unlimited, God. And we pray, O Lord, that you, as we continue to uh, study, as we continue to fellowship, O Lord, together, reveal more and more unto us, O Lord. Mm -hmm and allow us to come closer unto you more and more through this. I want to thank you for this evening, O oh Lord, for this time, and to Pastor Dan for leading this session, O oh Lord. Uh, once again, Lord, we commit each one of us into your able and mighty hand. I want to thank you and bless you, give you glory and honor. In the most precious name of Jesus, we pray and we believe. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you all, and have a good evening, everyone. Good night, everyone. God bless. Oh,